Hey everyone, welcome to Coffee with Colleen. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We have uh, two special guests, Representative Mike Chapman um, and Representative Theringer as well joining us. So um, we're really excited to have them. We're at a key part in the legislative process. Um, so we feel fortunate to have them join us for our discussion this morning. Um, I'm really gonna let them kick it off and, and tell us what's going on um, currently in the session. Um, key date to keep in mind is the final stretch of this current legis legislative session is scheduled to end on March 7th. Um, so with that, um, I don't know if one of you prefer to, to speak first, but we just wanted to get an overview where we're at. Why don't we let uh, youth before beauty? So we'll let Mike go first. <laughs> you have the floor, Mike. Or no, I think senior experience should go first, but I'll just touch real, real quick. Uh, we are we are in kind of the last about 10 days. It's kind of a sprint from here on out. Um, most of the committee work is done. I know the committee that I chair, Ag and Natural Resources, we wrapped up last week, um, kind of finalizing about uh, the Senate sent about 12 bills to my committee and we passed, I think, nine of them. Um, all virtually unanimously. They're all widely bipartisan. Um, as we finish the sprint, we're kind of on the bouncing between the House floor. Some of the budget negotiators, like Stephen mentioned, are also kind of bouncing, trying to transportation operating and capital. I'll let Steve talk more about that. I think, um, you know, this is a short session. And I know many of you have been down, uh, have already been down in Olympia. And I think um, hopefully expectations were a little measured. The budgets are probably a little tighter than have been the last few years and in a short session, lots of legislation that gets introduced, but it makes it even trickier for that legislation to see the finish line and some comes out of the house and then goes to that other body and doesn't do so well. And some of their bills come over to our side. So it's all part of the process. So we're kind of getting down to just the core core, core bills that we want to pass along with, um, these are supplemental budgets. So not a lot of new spending and I think overriding and we've seen kind of the dominant, maybe one of the dominant features of the legislation are the six initiatives and how the legislature is going to deal with those. Um, and we've kind of had, we've had some many debates on the floor and I think it looks like two or three are moving through public hearings with maybe, hopefully, I think some of us would hope that maybe two or three would actually be voted into law so that then the public is maybe down to three, uh, three or four initiatives to consider in the fall. If you put all six on the ballot, it's just a lot, and there's probably some of these, uh, two or three of these, I believe, I think all, there's three that we could easily and should probably vote um, into law. So with that, and I know this, you know, this is a group that always wants, has lots of questions. So um, that's my overview, and I'll throw it back over to Steve. Yeah, great job, Mike. I think you really did sum it up pretty well. Um, no more committee meetings. Now it's just floor action in the two chambers uh, as bills pass back and forth between the two chambers, and then the budget writers, the the operating budget, which is the largest budget, and then transportation, and then the capital budget, which I work on. We're meeting kind of in the evenings and early in the mornings to try and get those reconciled and, and then uh, voted off the chamber floors to get to the governor's desk. As Mike mentioned, this is a, so this is the second year of the biennial cycle, so it's really supplemental budgets. Um, the capital budget has some you know, usually a supplemental budget is whatever bonds we had left in our balance when we left town in the year in the first year of the biennium, and that would have been about a, about ninety nine million. But uh, because of there being some um, uh, school construction money and common school construction fund dollars, which is actually the dollars that come from the capital gains tax that are dedicated to school construction after the first 500 million, which totals about 313 million, and then Climate Commitment Act dollars, which is about 670 million. We have a very robust supplemental capital budget of about 103 or 1.3 billion. So, but there it's tricky, as Mike mentioned, because of the initiatives, we can't really spend dollars that we might not have if the initiatives are passed. So there's a lot of caveats in our budget that makes those dollars that are dependent on those revenue streams not really uh, available till January 1 of 2020, 2025. 
So that's kind of an added uh, challenge. And if you start looking into the budgets, you will see that notation on a number of the uh, a number of the expenditures that have been budgeted. Because you know our fiscal year goes, of course, to the end of June in twenty five. So we need to have dollars available. We want to have dollars available for different projects, but we have to put that caveat on it. Um, and um, there's some, I think some good stuff we're focusing on, on school construction and housing, which is a real, you know, challenge across, um, you know, housing has been a challenge, I think, in every community across the state. And then, you know, the behavioral health issues around opioids and, you um, you know that that's a challenge in, in almost every community in the state. So we're making in, you know investments in um, community health centers, partnering with the tribes in a number of places around the state, as we have with Jamestown and Squim and on the North Peninsula. Continuing that effort, uh, I think, in other communities around the state, and then um, we purchased a, a, a hospital you know, over the interim. Uh, Cascade Heritage, it's now called, which will help us with some of the challenges in, um, in you know, just the backlog for those of folks that are, and I see Ma, Michael Maxwell's on the call, you know, folks that are in the healthcare world and dealing with uh, our hospitals being jammed with folks that really should be in hospitals or in treatment facilities. So we're trying to work, work through that. Um, there's pretty robust dollars in the budget for home ownership, which is like Habitat, trying to partner with that, uh, with them. Uh, and um, we, with the Climate Commitment Act dollars, we're investing in ref, uh, energy efficiency in a number of the public supported housing facilities around, around the state and trying to make them uh, energy efficient. Just a kind of a data point uh, an elementary school down in Grace Harbor, which is in our district, contracted with a, uh, a, a sort of a, uh, uh, a energy consultant out of Portland. And they, using some sensors on their uh, heating and cooling system and putting um, and some AI technology, they were able to serve, save $13,000 in two months on their energy bill. So when we talk about school funding and other funding uh, for just general operation, using climate commitment dollars to change HVAC uh, and heating systems and cooling systems is really going to not only have benefit for better air for, for folks in that building, but there's huge savings as we make those transitions. So, um, you know, we're trying to make be targeted on, on those investments uh, in the capital budget as well as um, in the healthcare space, um, trying to invest in, in clinics in schools. As folks know, there's some real challenge with students, um, you know, on the behavioral health side and on the physical health side. And having that, those services available in the school setting is really, uh, has, shows huge advantage. I think just in general, trying to get upstream on issues, whether it's these health clinics or early learning facilities or daycare. That's just, you know, what we're trying to do in this supplement, supplemental budget is, uh, is target some investments in that. So as Mike said, we really are interested in your questions and I'll just leave that, I'll leave the, that update now and just uh, we'll open it up for questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, so if, if anyone that, that's interested in asking a question, you can enter it in the chat or just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll um, unmute you and you can ask from there. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing I was curious about was the, the transportation budget. Um, is it possible to elaborate on, on, on what's going on there? Serving on the transportation committee, but I'm not on the budget uh, a group, I will say, so the House passed a, a, I think it was the unanimous transportation, supplemental transportation budget last Saturday. Uh, the Senate has also passed their transportation budget. Um, we were briefed. There's a, there's a really, there's a big difference between the two. And so right now, I, you know, in the, in, you know, there's often differences between the budgets and Steve knows that. And, and, but this one's kind of a wide gulf and part of it is 
the Senate budget used some some climate commitment dollars that I'm not sure House budget writers are as comfortable using and may well again can you can you allocate funds down the road that may not be there. Um, there's also a, a really tricky deal where there the Senate had a priority that you may, may so if you are familiar with Seattle and the the new 520 floating bridge and the whole Portage Bay area where residents there kind of want a lid over the new structure to quiet the noise down as they live along Lake Washington. Now that was an $800 million new budget request, I believe, from the Senate in their budget. And, you know, I just don't know that that's a value that the House Transportation Committee has. So that's one that's going to be, what's it, that's going to be one that's going to be a little tricky. Um, you know, I don't know that I want to tell my constituents your gas tax dollars are going to build a lid for rich people on Lake Washington. It just seems like that's not going to be a winning issue for me down the road. So, um, and the chair of transportation, Jake Fi, which I think I mentioned before, he's like our, I mean, like he's a Port Angeles kid. Uh, Fi Road, west of Port Angeles, is named after Jake's family. Grew up in Port Angeles, Port Angeles High School graduate. Certainly has been a great partner and continues to support the efforts that we have with the squim to blend interchange. So, I mean, those are the conversations he had with me is like, hey, if we fund this project, you know, squim to blend's going to get pushed out. That's And his he always couches it. Yeah, Mike, and that's not going to be a good deal for you. Like, so I need, you know, so he's really cool and he's working really hard. So I'm not, there is a chance. I mean, I think the house passed a really good transportation budget. And because this is a supplemental year, I'm not saying it's likely, but you know, I think over an issue like this, there could be a chance that there is no supplemental transportation budget and we'll just live with the two-year budget, which I think for the district turned out really well. So yeah, it's, it's issues like that. I also, a lot of work in the ferry space. I re, I'm reluctant maybe to even mention the word ferries on this call, but I know it's super important. A lot of work, I think I personally uh, co-sponsored four different bills dealing with ferries. And I think we're kind of narrowing in on a plan Maybe it's not as quick and robust as folks want, but one of the challenges with the ferries is as we've moved, trying to move to electrification of ferry fleets, getting the bids, finding responsible bidders. But the state also has not been necessarily the best partner um, because they've really put all the cost overruns on the shipbuilder. And these are, this is a new product and there's not a lot of shipbuilders that build ferries that are electric um, hybrid. So I think we're trying to streamline that and hopefully streamline the bidding process, the building process. But in the meantime, still recruiting workers. There, there were a very shortage of workers. It's been abated a little bit. And I think you'll see a more, uh, more um, I think if a ferry scheduled in the future, it looks like as long as that boat's running. But our fleet is old and there's been a lot of criticism that the legislature waited too long and that the move to electrification was maybe not the right move. You know, that's a debate for another day and 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 we'll leave it at that. But I do think you'll see, you, you are seeing quite a bit more movement. But I, yeah, again, ferries are tough and it's super important to our district. I realize that. So um, in the Senate budget, there was a roundabout requested in James in Blinn. The Senate budget was able to fund it, but they were able to fund it with, again, climate commitment dollars and not sure in the difference between the Senate and the House budget if that project's going to stay, but I think, you know, I think we're going to work with the tribe to get a roundabout there in Blinn and connect the trail and make sure that that whole area is safe. But I see Matthews on the call. I just want you to know the Squim to Blinn project still. You know, we're not going to give that up. We're not going to delay it. Um, so super important. And I hope you all realize in the Elwha Bridge is being built every time I go out west. Really cool to see that project finally come to fruition. If folks remember, I was able to get a supplemental budget request my very first year in the legislature. That was the good news that, you know, it's, that was 2017 budget year and it's 2024, but it is being built. And there was a lot of COVID dealing with the national park, dealing with an act of Congress to acquire some national park land. But I think that bridge sets up the trans, you know, route between east and west of Clallam County for the next hundred years. And the reason the old bridge needed to be replaced is it was never built on bedrock. And so it was always at risk as the as the dams came down and the river flows rose. So really good to see a really great project and kind of fun to see something you worked on in 2017 finally get built that is not, you know, probably not, again, not 
nothing to shout about, but at least it is being built and it's going to be a great project for our community. So I don't know, Steve, if you want to talk. Yeah, no, the only, the, Mike, very comprehensive. The only thing I would add is um, there's just so much construction going on that prices have just gone through the roof, partly because contractors have a lot of work. And so they come in with bids and you may probably be experiencing this just, to, you know, in your normal contracting they're just coming in with really inflated bids going, hey, I don't, I'm so busy, but I'll do this if you'll pay me, you know, 50% more. And also there's issues around just supply chain, you know, just concrete and steel and all that. So that's really impacting the transportation budget more than I think the capital budget because of the just the magnitude of those projects, right? So that's that's why. The supplemental budget is, is in transportation is very challenged right now. And, and of course, in the long term, the revenue stream is a challenge because the gas tax was the, is the main funding source. And that's being depleted as we drive electric cars and hybrid cars and move to a, you know, away from a fossil fuel economy. So um, that's that really just makes that a challenging budget and now and I think going into the into the future. And I don't know, Matt, Mitch, if you're gonna handle this or you want us to call on hands that are coming up, however you want to do it. Oh yeah, I'll I'll do it. Great. Thank you okay, for the great. um so first was Darlene. Darlene, did you have a question? I do. Hi Mike. Hi Steve. Um 6163 uh monitoring the PFAS and biosolids, sewage waste it uh, was referred to appropriations February 21. I Can you tell me what that means and can you rescue it and get it to the House for a full vote? No, uh, not this time because uh, the fiscal cutoff was Monday Monday night. And if it's not if it didn't make it out of uh, probes by Monday, it might it just it won't make it to the to rules or, or you know to the floor mm -hmm. i mean things can happen uh but usually it, those bills that have a second life in this situation have really what they call uh ntib either necessary implant to, to impact the budget or have a more of a fiscal impact this is kind of a straight study policy bill so i think that um you know, it's going to have to wait till next year. But I will say there's quite a bit of uh, actually uh, Commissioner Eisenhower in Jefferson County has been working uh, and highlighting that there is a real challenge with uh, capacity in a lot of our treatment facilities on the North Peninsula. Yeah. And so we do have some proviso language to study that issue which I think will stay in the budget, but it's not just to the peninsula, it's across the state. I've talked to legislators from, from Kettle Falls and, and uh, up, in, up in the Northeast corner. We just have a challenge as, as folks need to note, I mean, we have almost 8 million people now living in the state of Washington. So there's just demands on almost all of our, whether it's our transportation system, our, uh, you know, our waters and sewer systems, and we have some antiquated technology and, and our, uh, our infrastructure. So this, I think, is good as I think about being capital budget chair. This is a thing we're going to have to focus on as we move forward. Not real you know, not real sexy, but pretty basic. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be uh, what we're going to need to do is make sure we have that capacity as we move forward. Can, yeah, can you, you know, Darlene, I, you, so, um, language? Sorry, Mike. Um, what was the, what was the, what was the comment, Darlene? Can you send me that proviso language? Yeah, I'll, I will, I will do that. Thank you. You know, folks, if you look at a bill in 6163, I mean, this is kind of a bill like this, and it happened in my committee that I chair. So this bill passes the Senate 49 to nothing. And most people would say, well, what's, you know, there's a no brainer. Um, and that's, it's true. But, you know, then things go to bills, go to a policy committee, and there's a pinch point. And eventually, the pinch point in both the House and the Senate is either appropriations or ways and means. And all those bills that come out of the other body where 
the first five weeks of session, we're just dealing with House of Origin bills. You know, after cutoff, we had four days in House committees to deal with all the Senate bills. And then appropriations only had, I think, what, five days to deal with all the bills. So the system and their supplemental budget, and I had four bills in my committee that also came out 49 to nothing. But, in four, you know, they had three, four weeks to work on it in the House of Origin. We had four days. So to a certain degree, it's all it is designed, you know, in a supplemental year, it is designed to just run out of time and many good pieces. of. And I think, Darlene, you know, I appreciate you calling in the office. And, but this is a this is one of those bills. I think, you know, most likely we just ran out of time and the appropriator, you know, appropriations and ways and means they just run out of time. There's cutoffs, there's deadlines and you got to move on to the next step. In a 105 day session, a bill like this that comes out 49 to nothing. The difference was that we would have had two and a half weeks in the House to deal with Senate bills. This year we have four days or committee days, I mean a week, but it's, you know, so that's a huge difference, but it's designed that way. Um, and I know it gets frustrating, but I suspect this will be a bill, Darlene, that'll come back. It'll be something that I'll look to, to co-sponsor in the future. I, I'm much, so, but it just, the expectations always have to be a little different um, in the shorter time frame. Some would say that we should always have 60 day sessions maybe, but. <laughs> Thank you. Great, right, thank you so much. Uh, next was Colleen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I have three questions about the capital budget. Uh, number one is, it seems like the House version and the Senate version were substantially different. And was that intentional? Was uh, that kind of coordinated? Another, my next question about the capital budget is, can you review the, the um, projects that are proposed to be funded in the House capital budget. And then lastly, I was really excited to see the 4.9 million in the House capital budget, but there wasn't any funding for it, uh, for the SWIM school district center of excellence that could be used by both the school district and the uh, Peninsula College. Is that, is there a potential for getting that into uh, the final budget when you negotiate with the Senate on it? Thank you. Well, Colleen, you've read the capital budget, both capital budgets, it seems, and you've highlighted some of the challenges that we're looking at as we go into negotiation. Um, so well, the major difference between the two budgets is uh, in the school construction, what's called SCAP, School Construction Assistance Program. We, and I think Port Angeles is a good example, SWIM not so much, but the way that formula has worked out, and it's a very complex formula, it really doesn't help many schools. And so we're, we have a proviso in our house budget, and this is a very bipartisan effort to try to, what we call, uh, it's called scrapper, which is to like scrap, scap, and move to a different formula. Um, and so what we decided is we did not want, in our budget, did not want to put any money, if you will, into the Corolla that is SCAP. We want to move dollars and move and, or move towards, you know, building the Lexus for school construction. The Senate has a different approach. The Senate is putting a, a, quite a bit of money into SCAP. It's really targeted at just a couple of schools or eight districts, quite frankly, that have already passed bonds. And so we think that's not a good approach because they've already passed their bonds and have structured their their whole you know program, their development program through the community and with their bo the school boards to uh, you know build based on the sort of the traditional formula. And this would be just additional dollars that would go to them that, in my view, they don't need. So we were we're. That is probably the main challenge that we face in trying to reconcile our budgets. And we think we can come up with a way that's a little more equitable. And we understand as we move from SCAP, which is existing structure, to a new structure, we have, we're going to be funding um, you know, sort of that transition in the legacy program as we move to hopefully a, a more equitable, transparent process. And... Um, and so that that's kind of the, what we're trying to figure out. I think that is um, as as we move forward, um, you know, we think that 
like schools and now those like schools would be schools of the same districts with this comparable enrollment and and comparable um sort of asset values right in their community should compete in in against each other and so we'd have maybe three or four different categories so port angeles for example wouldn't be trying to compete against mercer island or pasco or seattle but that's work we're going to have to do on the interim so the, that discussion and how we settle those numbers um sort of impacts how whether we can hold the five million dollars that are in the budget right now for um for the center of excellence for squim and um i see regan nichols the superintendent is on the call i had a very interesting conversation with uh, and i see colleen roberts it's also on the call with the guy who runs the skill center in in pasco and the tri-cities and they have a great relationship between their carpentry and construction program with habitat and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to uh while we're trying to stand up this this you know center of excellence if you will because i think that you know basically across the street habitat's going to be building those houses and to have that synergy i think is just a great you know, just a great um, symbiosis that we want to have going on. So I'm hoping when we can settle all this out that uh, we'll be able to hold on to that $5 million and, and make that a reality for the school, the school districts. But I'll know more after tonight because we have a very long um, negotiation session tonight to try to, to work that out. And um, Colleen, you had three questions. I can't remember the middle one, actually. <clears throat> I will say we had um, in our caucus this week, or it's the end of yeah, last week. Um, was... Go ahead. Oh, my my question was, can you review the projects that are in the capital budget for Clallam County? Yeah, so a couple of them that I think are exciting. We meant talked about the Center of Excellence. We've got money in, in our early learning and daycare to help, um, as folks know in Port Angeles, maybe the old high school administration building was purchased by Olympic Medical Center. They thought they would move their offices there. And it just to to make, to sort of remodel it, refers, it was way too expensive, but um, they are working with uh, Steve Burke at the pool who has you know a, a daycare center at the pool to expand into that space. So I think we have like $600,000 in the budget to help make that happen. And all of, a lot of you know that there's such a challenge for daycare. Um, and I think Olympic Medical Center, and again, you know, uh, Nora has that same challenge of just finding daycare for, for folks to be able to, you know, work. So that's in the budget. Um, <clears throat> there's some money in Port Towns, in for Port Towns, in the Port of Port Towns. And, They've got some ARPA money that would be lost if they don't get that spent by the end of the year. We're able to, and they had they had lost some other match. So we're using some uh, model toxics account money to help them match that and move that stormwater project forward in, in, in Port Townsend. Um, those are the ones that kind of pop into mind right now. So, um, and hopefully, uh, um, you know, we can hold those into the into the into the budget when we get a conference agreement from with the Senate. I will say I wanted to say that uh, we had Senator Murray and and Congressman Kilmer down in our caucus this this week, or might have been the last part of last week, and we did bring up um, you know a recompete legislation and that and I think you know Colleen and the EDC and a lot of folks on this call have been working very hard on that um and I would say that uh need to contact Senator Murray obviously she's chair of Ways and Means or Appropriations of the Senate she is a you know the decider on a lot of this stuff and I think uh contact with her um and sort of pointing out how important this investment would be for the North Peninsula would be helpful. Great. Okay, great. great. Thank you. <laughs> it's on it. Uh, all right, next question. 
Um, Timothy Dalton. Oh, you're on. You're on mute. There we go. Good morning, representatives. I'm Timothy Dalton. I'm Collin County Housing and Grant Resource Director. I have a couple of questions. First one's concerning 5334, um, the short-term rental increase tax for affordable housing. I know it came out of uh, committee and it's in rules too. Um, what are the chances of it making the floor for a vote and actually getting passed in this? I, I know it came close last session, um, actually getting through on this legislative session. And the second question I have is, Representative Theringer, you, you were talking about habitat. At what point in time can we look to, like say, increase um, habitat self-help builds from 80% of AMI up to 100, say 100% of AMI to work on that missing middle, the workforce housing that's kind of left out of both ends. We have a lot of low income housing projects, but nothing for that missing middle that can help. Um, thank you. Yeah, good questions. Uh, I'll take the second one first. We did have a bill um, uh, called Housing Accelerator, which really did target that gap between 60 and 80 uh, percent. It was going to be a revolving fund. It came out of the House. Uh, it did not get out of Ways and Means in the Senate. Um, and so it's dead for this session right now. Um, but I think it's targeted pretty well on what would be as a we would seed with uh, a state dollars, uh, you know, bonds or capital budget, the um, a revolving fund that then would uh, private developers and nonprofits and, you know, pretty full spectrum of developers could use those dollars and it targeted that gap between 60 and 80. Um, we hope to bring that back next year. Again, as Mike mentioned, that's a major policy. We weren't probably going to be able to fund it in this supplemental, but we wanted to, uh, I was interested in getting the policy established and the account established, but that didn't happen in the Senate. So we'll come back to that uh, to try and fix that. On the 5354, um, to be honest, I think that's a challenge uh, to get that out if that's the, is that the real estate excise tax? Is that no, 5334 what? is the short term rental for a four year old? Yeah, I'm, well, are you familiar with this? I'm a little more, well, I'm not more familiar, but this is a local option to allow cities to implement a tax on the, on people, on short-term rentals. It would exempt if you rent your room out, but the, the, I think for local governments and I, you know, I, that one did come out of finance. It literally sits in the rules. It's already passed. Uh, the Senate, I believe. Right. Yep. Yes. Um, and the the uses uh, allowing the legislative authority of a county or city to impose an excise tax on the sale uh, of of lodging, so the rental of short term rentals through um, up to ten percent, <clears throat> if they use a platform with revenue from the tax to be used for providing affordable or workforce housing, supportive housing services, rental assistance or assisting the operations um, dedicated to providing counseling um, and other assistance for acquiring rentals. It exempts owner-occupied dwelling in which rented rooms share a common entryway from the tax. And it requires the city or the county imposing the tax to publish an annual report detailing how the tax was spent the previous year. So this would be the first time that a local option would be put on. And obviously in Clallam County, you know, you're all having a huge debate over especially in where I live in Port Angeles of the use of short-term rentals and how do they, what benefit do they bring and what negative, maybe if there was a way to generate revenue that would help supportive housing, maybe there would be less of a, I don't know, but less, I think I've talked to some of the folks in the short-term housing industry. They're kind of interested in this bill moving forward as a way to say, you know, we want to be a good partner in the community. We don't want to be the bane of everyone's existence. Um, and you all know me, I'm, you know, generally not met many taxes that I'm super excited about. I have to say right now, I'm pretty excited about this. It's not a mandate. It would be an option. And I think it might be something that folks as cities and maybe even the county look at these policies. Where do these fit into our economy? And if the housing industry itself, the short-term housing industry says this is maybe something we want to see move forward. And you look at the revenue, it just doesn't go into a black hole of general fund, but it would be for specific uses. I think that's what you're hitting at, Timothy. And I like the idea that then the city and the county, whoever implemented it, would have to do a report. And then 
you know, it could be it. It's an it's an option. So an option can always if it's not working. But I'm I've generally supported tried to support local options. Um, and again, I'm not saying I'm 100% would vote for it in five minutes if it came up on the floor, but definitely leaning that way unless someone gives me a compelling reason why it would be a disaster. I haven't heard that yet. If it was a mandate, if the city, if the state was telling everybody they had to do that, that then we were spending the money. That might be, you know, it's a different deal. But I don't know, Steve. This one's popping yeah, up. Yeah, I think it, I, I don't know. I think there's some challenges with this one, um, uh, especially from from communities where you know, uh, as the debate's been going on in Port Angeles uh, around this and taxing this is um, for the resort communities. I think it's a challenge. Um, but we'll see, you know, uh, there's still time. Obviously, there's about a week left. It, it did come I out of still, I, Yes. Yeah. Um, I did want to add that, uh, you know, on this, when I talked about the accelerator, uh, how, how, housing, uh, housing investments accelerator for that ban, I also have a draft bill um, you know, sitting on my desk that I was going to do that for uh, owner built housing for Habitat type uh, approaches to do the same thing, to develop a revolving fund. We didn't do it because again, we didn't have any money to set that up, but I think um, we'll try to do that next year. So we'd have two different uh, programs, one for uh, owner built and one for, you know, uh, regular construction that would be revolving funds that we would seed with, with state dollars to get going. Right. Uh, Randy Johnson, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, first, uh, I want to thank Steve very much for the whole child care um, issue, since I sit on both the pool board as well as the Y board. So, you know, uh, together, though, that we can really make a difference for child care. Um, I just wanted to also add a quick factoid. Uh, housing uh, or lodging tax gener generates about one point eight million dollars. That's four percent. So if you did 10%, you know, that would actually be a very significant amount of money if you put it together. So uh, uh, just as a point of information. Um, quick question of you, Steve. Uh, you said the Climate Commitment Act related to uh, capital items. Is that noted in the, in, in, so if I look at the budget, I can see which items are added or, or, or right. I guess. Uh, yeah, you'll see that by section. So that was part of what we're trying to figure out. We There's projects and things we want to invest in, like right away when the budget is signed to get us, you know, to provide math, particularly for federal dollars. So those those will be existing revenues that are kind of in the in the account right now and can be expended through the end of the year. And then dollars are, that are based on uh, if if the initiative fails, then we would see additional revenue and we would know that by January 1, 2025. So then those dollars would be spent moving forward. So we're, we're trying to figure out the priorities. And as folks may know, a lot of that, I think that ARPA money has to be spent and, and committed by the end of the year. So we don't want statewide, we don't want to leave any of that money on the table. So, and where we can use CCA, to match that, we want to use money that's sort of in the account. Um, and we have to do a bunch of uh, a sort of established accounts. If the initiative passes, every, all those accounts go away. They would just disappear. And that money that was ever left would go into um, the, the general fund state. And so we're setting up a separate account. So if that initiative does pass, that money stays in a separate sort of climate account so we can spend the dollars that have been uh, already, you know, um, realized through the through the, the sales, the credit sales. So it's a little complicated. Um, and as I think Mike mentioned in his opening remarks, they've the initiatives have really sort of complicated and clouded a lot of the policy. But if you look in the budget, you can see which funding is has that caveat on it and which funding doesn't. Thank you. I, I had a, another very quick question because all I, I got is information was in the newspaper, so I'd never know. And I think it was Bill 2114, which was a 7% rent cap and a, a myriad of other kinds of things. And I think you both took alternate positions on that. 
I could argue on either side of that. So I just wondered if, if you either of you wanted to comment on that. So. Uh, well, as folks know, it did not pass out of ways and means. So that policy is in the Senate. So that policy is dead for this session. My view, I voted for it. Um, I think that uh, a seven percent cap is a legitimate cap on an annual basis, and there were uh, there was a moratorium. So one of the issues was whether you would, um, you know, you wanted not to have this policy interfere with people that wanted to invest in new housing. And I think a ten year time frame made it possible for people to, uh, you know, actualize their investment back. And I think there was talk of an, uh, an amendment that would have extended that out to 15 years. In our district, and I don't know, folks, there was a there was a pretty interesting article down in the in the Columbian yesterday. Folks in mobile home parks that are being bought up by LLCs or folks, you know, investors are driving up these rents 12, 14, even 50 percent. And for people that are on fixed income, that makes them homeless. And the largest growing cohort in homeless people are people 80 or older, I think, or 75 and older. And it seemed to me that um, putting some, this is not rent control, it's a stabilization. So there'll be a 7% on an annual basis increase. And as folks know, they're in this industry, you get to, you don't pay B&O and you don't, and you get to write off all your costs on your federal tax return. So um, I felt that there was enough sort of flexibility in this program to help provide some stability in folks that are making these investments, but also stability for people that are in this housing. But uh, it's pretty much, unless there's some sort of miracle that happens, it's pretty much dead for this session. And I want to do just as uh, I was thinking about other things we've done in the budget. Um, we do have 2.5 million in the budget right now for uh, the biochar pro uh, investment that's happening in, in Port Angeles to help them with their energy design. And uh, and there was uh, for the for the Y in Port Angeles, there's a half a million dollars to help them with um, you know move that project forward as Aunt Randy mentioned for for uh, childcare. Uh, yeah, you know, Randy, you made a good point. You could argue either way. I think uh, I think those of us who you know had to had a had had a vote on the House floor probably did that with ourselves. Um, you can make the case. For the bill, you could make the case against it. I think for me, one of the deciding factors was there was an amendment that was offered that would have exempted folks who had five units or less. And that's really the smallest of the smalls. And for me, that was when that amendment was rejected. And I had a, I had a, I had a, I went to the, the, the committee chair who makes the recommendations on whether amendments are rejected and indicated that that was a really important amendment for the district. And, and he, I, I was not as respected as I thought I should be as someone who was working through the process. So for me, it made it fairly easy um, to vote no. But I think it's, a, look, it's one of those, it's going to be one of those votes that if you vote for it or against it, you're going to be routinely criticized on both sides of the issue. And there is no right or wrong answer. Um, my prediction is I'll probably get criticized more for voting no in the district than maybe Steve will for voting yes. Um, and for those who want to just make assumptions as maybe what happened in ways and means, I wouldn't. Um, I was actually fairly had a chance to meet with a number of senators before we voted on that bill coming out of the House, met with some uh, some some leadership. Don't make assumptions as to maybe why that bill didn't make it out of ways and means. I know people want to and they probably want to point to a certain senator who represents the 24th. I just argue I would just point say this out again. I, I expect to be routinely criticized for voting no. I'll accept that and I'll accept, I'll listen to folks and see where we go from there. But individual members on committees and in the legislature. Well, see, Steve's already getting a thank you for no anyway. Um, for you know, you, there's a lot of moving parts. And one of the things that I'll just put on the record, I think it's so important for all of you to hear. You know, yeah, Steve votes one way and I vote another, but I can guarantee you both before, during, and then again after the vote, there's a handshake, there's a slap on the back, and there's looking at each other's eyes and saying, hey, I respect the hell out of your position. And and the and then we, you know, I you know, back and forth, and we always are putting the district first, and we and there are other districts where 
a split vote like that, and you might have members who don't chat, who don't talk the rest of the session. And then same with Senator Vandeway. And if you look at our voting record over the years, there's always maybe one of us going a little different direction, but we're always putting the 24th, working hard as a team. And, and I hope that you all can appreciate that, that we we all three are a little different, but we all are always like on capital, transpo, big, big issues. But I just would caution folks who maybe want to point to the process in the Senate and just make some assumptions. Um, I just encourage you not to and take a walk a day in our shoes, you know, again, but I, like I said, I'll be criticized routine roundly for my no vote. Um, and I don't, we'll figure, you know, we'll see where we go from here. So just my, it's kind of a 30,000 foot assessment, but. And Mike, my final comment is of course, we all get criticized for our votes. So I, I probably understand that as well as anyone. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, we got about 10 minutes left, 12 minutes left. So I uh, want to get uh, address the question in the chat and then we'll go to Reagan from there. Um, James asks, where where are we at on the building codes driving up costs of home construction? Can you elaborate on that at all? Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I think there's been um, some you know, some discussion around that and some, uh, some, um, I guess, uh, adjustments around SEPA and some of the, some of the permitting processes, there haven't been a lot of changes in the, uh, in the building code that I know of. Um, Mike may be more familiar with that. I will, as I mentioned, for folks that maybe, you know, around the, uh, came to the call a little later, we had some, there was an interesting article in the Daily World last week about a great school down in Grace Harbor that put some uh, sensing sensing equipment on their HVAC system and ended up saving about thirteen thousand dollars over two months. So uh, these codes are different, and the initial you know requirements for the uh, you know new water heaters and the new insulation, all that, I, no question, adds a, adds costs to the construction and the and the permitting. But um, the long-term benefit is is pretty clear. So, um, but I've not. Mike may know more about where we are with the building codes themselves. Yeah, no. I mean, there's a state building code council, and they tend to kind of lead the charge on this. And if they follow the international codes, I served on that council for a while. And one of the frustrating parts is that I was a legislative rep to the building code council. I had no vote. So I realized I'm driving three hours, Olympia, this was before COVID, and then I just sat there. It's been a fresh, that the Building Code Council has been a frustrating experience. There's actually been a few lawsuits over who was appointed and who they were representing. I think that you're going to have to, I think building codes are going to, that's a national issue. Um, the state just kind of follows along and implement. We don't, you know, we've implemented some energy issues, but, um, and, you know, a lot of times I, I see houses being built, you know, they're five, six hundred thousand dollars. And I hear numbers at 30 percent that the code that the permit fees and the building codes. I have a hard time believing on a six hundred thousand dollar house that permit fees and codes are, are, are taking two hundred grand. So I'd love to see if some, you know, and I've talked with the builders. So I'd like to see, like, where do you get those numbers I just, I don't buy it. I know the fees are fairly high, but like Matthew's got it around the city. He's going to charge the hookup, but that's, you know, on the, some of these homes that are being built. Where, and I think we've also looked trying to provide some relief for some of the affordable housing projects and that sort of thing. And, you know, it's, um, and finally, and if Senator Vandeway were on the call, I'm not speaking for him, but I've heard him say, you know, I think, I think we're all pretty glad we have modern building codes so that when we have an earthquake or a natural disaster, or, you know, our buildings have a pretty good chance to survive. So I know it's frustrating, but I also don't know that it's 30% of the cost. I, I'm having a hard time with the math on that. Great. Thank you. Also, thank you, Haley, for uh, breaking down the recompete. Um, she, she mentioned in the chat, uh, regarding recompete, there's only money for four to eight of the 22 projects to be funded. Securing additional funding for fiscal year 24 would directly increase the odds and is critical to advocate for. Um, we're counting on Senator Murray as chair of the appropriate committees to help make this happen. Um, so thank you, Haley. 
Um, Reagan, thank you for being patient. Uh, you're up. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, uh, to both of you, thank you so much. Um, I just want to let everyone know that uh, this fall and into this winter, we have received uh, time and attention from you both, and we've appreciated that, uh, both in your visits to our schools and also day on the hill, of course. And education funding um, has been rough, of course, in the short session, and yet, um, your championing of our CTE project and the capital budget, and then to hear the work on SCAP, I love the scrapper um, <laughs> term, um, that is so appreciated. And for so many of us on this call, um, the CTE effort has been community-wide, and we know that the benefits of this could extend to so, so many aspects of our community and our workforce. And so tonight's negotiations are critical for us, and we appreciate all the energy toward that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask a question about the um, work on the SCAP formula. And I know that I've heard you speak um, briefly around modular building being in the future. And is that uh, discussion gaining any momentum? And do we see that as part of the SCAP negotiations? Yeah, thanks, uh, Superintendent, for that. Um, yeah, it is. There actually have been... Um, uh, some folks in my office who run a uh, cross line and timber uh, factory in, in Spokane Valley. And then we have a couple others uh, uh, around the state. And so that will be part of it. Well, whether it's part of it right when we, you know, when we make this transition, uh, I don't know. But I think the idea is that there's enough examples now around um there's one in Seattle. There's, uh, uh, you know, obviously the five, the four or five classrooms we built a few years ago, of which uh, Gray Wolf was one of those, to show that shows the practicality of that. And I guess the big question is whether we have the production chain available. But for example, I would think that take Port Angeles, for example, which is sorely in need of some new schools. Um, if we could show to them that hey, we're going to build this school with uh, timber that's coming off the peninsula and we're going to laminate it up and you're going to build these schools. And uh, I would think that would all lead to a lot of public support for, you know, for a local bond. And then hopefully the formula, the formula is going to cost the state more money. There's no question about it. And, but how it changes is right now, the district passes a bond, you're entitled to the match the, in SCAP. The problem is, is that match basically pays state sales tax. And so it does, it's not that beneficial. So it'll be go from an entitlement to a competition. But if you, and as we work down the list, depending on the funding the state puts in, you will be guaranteed that money and you will know what that money is and what that what it's gonna pay for before you go to the voters to pass your bond. So um, that's, that's the hope that this will then bring more local support for bonds. And then if we can get some standardized construction, that will hopefully drive down some of the costs. Um, you know, that's a little theoretical, but we're, there's this very much, at least in the House side, a very bipartisan effort to try to figure this out by, I mean, to be honest, we hope to have, you know, that's going to be our interim work and then, you know, have some policy probably next year. And I would suspect in the supplemental, this will it'll probably take two years of legislative process to get that actually done. But I would think by this time, um, two years from now, we will have a new formula that will, I think, benefit everybody and will cost the state more money, but we'll actually be building stuff with some some transparency and some predictability. Thank you very much for that. And I'd just like to say that um, Squim School District would be very interested in being at a ground floor around this because uh, we certainly have aged facilities and we know we need to look into the future. But looking forward with that type of idea, I think would be a good fit. Well, thank you. And, and just don't hesitate if you guys have ideas and maybe during the interim, you know, we should maybe meet and talk about this because it's right now a very iterative process to, to develop this. And, you know, we'll probably being the legislature, we won't get it right the first time. So we'll have to. But, uh, you know, we'll keep working on it. 
we'll be in touch and thanks for tonight's discussion. Great. Great, thank you so much. We probably got time for about one more question. Uh, I believe Lindsay, you are up. Hey, thanks so much representatives. I wanna ask about the Affordable Homes Act um, because I think that is necessary to implement the budget and is still a possibility of this session. So my understanding is it would it would lower real estate excise taxes for smaller home sales, I think maybe less than $750,000, but it would increase real estate excise tax by 1% for sales over something a little bit around $3 million. It sounds to me like people who are buying and selling homes over $3 million could afford an extra 1% to put into the housing trust fund so that we can work better to solve homelessness. Um, but I understand some people locally may maybe have opposed that. And I'd love to hear reasons why people buying and selling property over $3 million can't afford an extra 1%. But is that bill something that we can hope to see come out of the session? Uh, my God, I don't think so. Um, there is a lot of challenges because a lot of those larger properties are warehouses and other commercial buildings, which is, as folks know, are really uh, stressed at this point. And if you've looked at the real estate excise tax revenues for the state, they've been uh, uh, diminishing. Um, and so um, I think the, the policy maybe has some support, but the timing is not right. So I'd be really surprised if it moves. I don't know what Mike's heard. Yeah, I also, I also I, even if, and I don't know, you know, even if the House were to pass today, I, I don't see a path in the Senate. So I don't know that I think the House has passed a couple of bills over to the Senate and they didn't they didn't make it. And I don't know that that's going to happen again. We're also just running out of time. That's a very long floor debate. And there's other policy bills and other funding bill, bills that we know we can pass. And you want to burn up. I mean, those are the those are the leadership decisions as we get down to crunch time. And we know that that would be a, a that'd be a very that bill would have a ton of amendments. All those amendments would have to be, it'd be a, you know, it'd be a multi-hour kind of a debate that would just obliterate a lot of good policy bills that we do need to have passed. So I, I think that's also part of it. And just the economic challenges around the state and kind of where the revenue is coming from. Again, it's also a short session. I think it's important to remember we also have six, you know, six initiatives we're facing on bills and issues we've voted on in the past. And for me, it's like, I do think you have to be respectful of the voters and, let them absorb and, and weigh in now on potentially up to six issues, hopefully only three, but you can't, you know, and yeah, so no, I don't think <laughs> long answer with a lot of caveats, but even if the house passed it, I don't see it that it would pass the Senate. So why, and why burn the time? And, and when I say there's a lot of good policy bills, I mean, there are a lot of bills that came out of the Senate 49 to nothing those are the kind of policy bills that you would want us. And there, a lot of them are education and we have some funding. I mean, we're looking at trying to raise the cap on special ed and raise your operation dollars and raise your transportation dollars and all the things that school districts, hospital, OMC, as Daryl tries to, and Mike knows this and we chatted as he tries to bring himself, we're trying to make sure that, and there's a bill coming that impacts mergers and acquisitions. And I'm, I guess, Mike, you didn't ask about that, but, you know, that's going to be a robust, that's on our run list I just saw for today, potentially. So we've got a lot of on our plate, as it were, just with what the Senate already did and what where the budget, and then we have budgets, still some budget challenges. So, and again, not a full session. And four days of committee work after the Senate bills really did make it create a pinch point. Conversely, the Senate also had four days to look at our bills um, after that. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Well, I just wanted to uh, reconfirm and um, reiterate everyone's comments in the chat. Thank you both, uh, Representative Steve Derringer and Representative Mike Chapman for joining us today. It was very informative. I know I learned a lot and I think that's the overall impression. Um, with that, uh, sounds hey, like- Hey Mitch, I see Reve's hands up and I'm, I know you don't have time, but I, Reve, if you want, yeah, I have a hunch, I know what you're calling on about it. If you wanna give me a call, um, she's uh, the wife of a guy down in Forks, so oh, okay. I'm assuming that's what she's calling about. I, I believe, yeah. Uh, do you have time to answer, or do, would you want to do that off off the chat? Well, yeah, if she wants to put it on the record. Like, if, if people need to, I mean. But yeah, we're supposed to be on there. the floor right now. We're supposed to be, I think we're gaveling in, so. Okay, um, well, 
we'll call it then. Uh, All right. All right. <laughs> Thank Thank you, you knows everybody. how to get a hold of me. Just my <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.